So what this means is that she never would have been able to come this close to shore. And this actually breaks a myth for you. She never bumped into a rock, had the pilgrims jump out on the rock and call it Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock wasn't even proposed as a symbol until about a hundred years after the Mayflower arrived. The channel is marked with buoys, similar to how a street would be marked. So you'll see that on the left side we have red pointy buoys that we call nuns, and on the right side we have green cylindrical buoys that we call cans. An easy way for our boaters to orient themselves within the channel is red right return. So you'll notice that the boats returning back to Plymouth are keeping the red on their right hand side. Looking off the right hand side of the boat, you'll see some hills. These are the pine hills of Manomet and they are the tallest coastal hills on the east coast. Where they drop off you might be able to see a tall red and white striped tower and this is the location of the nuclear power plant. So a little bit more about the boat you're on right now, the Pilgrim Bell. She was built in 1992, which makes her 26 years old. She was originally named the Rebecca Lee, and when she was acquired in Captain John Boats in 1998, she was renamed the Pilgrim Bell. If you go downstairs in the galley area, we have two photos hanging up. One when she was the Rebecca Lee and another after she was renamed the Pilgrim Bell. Pretty interesting to look at some of the changes that they made. She's about 60 feet long, draws five feet of water, and she's an authentic Mississippi style paddle wheel vessel. So what this means is that the two paddles you see on the back are in fact our only source of propulsion. There are no thrusters, no propellers, just those two paddles. They are diesel hydraulically operated. We have two John Deere engines on board and each paddle has its own rudder. However, the rudder is forward of the paddle. So if you're familiar with boats, you may understand how this negatively affects our maneuverability. But to make up for this, I am able to operate the paddles independently, similar to a twin screw and twist the vessel. So you'll notice that Plymouth Harbor is home to a wide variety of vessels, lots of recreational boats, but we also have quite a few commercial vessels. There are about 70 to 80 lobstermen that work out of Plymouth all year round, provided that there's no ice. I'm sure we'll pass a lobster boat at some point during our trip, and if we do, I'll point it out to you, but they're all pretty similar looking, about 30 feet long, squarish cabin, and a wide open workspace on the back. Usually pretty easily identifiable by all the lobster gear they have on board. And up ahead, just right outside the channel on the right hand side, 
you'll notice there there are lots of little buoys in the water that are whitish or orangish in color. These are called high flyers and they're lobster pot markers. So beneath each one of these little buoys is a lobster pot or a lobster trap. The lobstermen bait them with things like fish heads or fish racks and leave them down for a few days, haul them back up and bring their catch into Plymouth. The buoys are all different colors. These colors indicate which lobsterman owns them. So if you went out a little bit further than we're going to today, you would see hundreds and hundreds of different colored lobster pot markers. So many, in fact, that they had to start labeling them with the last four digits of the social security number of the lobsterman that owns them. It's actually quite ironic that Plymouth is such an important lobster landing port. And that's because back when the pilgrims arrived, the Native Americans taught them that lobsters were gross to eat. They were a poor man's food and you only eat them if you were starving. The famous story of the Native Americans teaching the pilgrims to plant fish with their corn seed was in fact lobsters. Lobsters are full of nutrients and make a great fertilizer. And back in those days, there was an abundance of them. They would actually wash up on the shore in piles. Years later, when prisons were being built, there were riots in the prisons because they were being fed the cheapest food available, lobsters. These riots led to a law that's still on the books today that states no prisoner in the Massachusetts penal system shall be fed lobster more than twice a week. Well, this piece of land that we're coming up to is Plymouth Beach, also known as Long Beach. It is connected back to the mainland, so it's a peninsula, not an island. And it's about three and a half miles long, but only a hundred yards wide. There's a beautiful sandy beach over on the other side and some great fishing over on this side. And you'll notice that there are quite a few houses out here. These are mostly summer houses, but no town services. These people have to provide all of their water, all their electricity using generators or solar panels, take out all their waste, and they also require a four-wheel drive vehicle to access the homes. But you'll notice that the last portion of the beach doesn't have any houses, and that's because the last 10 acres or so are a wildlife sanctuary. We have quite a few different species of migratory seabirds that come here to rest during their migration or lay their eggs. We have at least four species of terns, the roseate, least common in Arctic terns, which are the little white birds with black heads. We have tons of seagulls, but probably most important is the piping plover. Piping plovers are federally endangered. They lay their eggs directly on the sand and those eggs are sand colored. 
they camouflage really well, so unless you are actively looking for them, you probably wouldn't see them. Before this area was protected, people were unknowingly stepping on the eggs and ultimately killing them, and this depleted their numbers. During the piping clover reproductive season, you'll see lots of yellow signs out there warning people that they're not allowed up on the dunes. And because this is a wildlife sanctuary, this also means that the houses that are currently built out here cannot be rebuilt if they're destroyed, and they also can't be sold. They can only be passed down to their family members. Another important function of Plymouth Beach is that it acts as a natural breakwater. So similar to that rock wall we saw earlier, Plymouth Beach also protects us from the wind and the waves. Here in New England, we experience some pretty nasty storms from the northeast that we call nor'easters. If you look where we are on a map and look in the northeast direction, there's nothing to block the wind and the waves. It's just the open Atlantic Ocean. This means that the wind and waves have hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles to build up. And by the time they reach us, we can experience 100 mile per hour winds or 30 foot seas. And these nasty storms definitely take their toll on areas like Plymouth Beach, causing pretty severe coastal erosion. However, there are a couple of things that can be done to try and mitigate that. You'll see that there's lots of seagrass out there. The roots of the seagrass help to hold the beach together. And you'll also notice at the edge that there's a man-made rock wall. If you look off the left hand side of the boat at about 9 o'clock, right above the tree line, you may be able to see a statue, sort of resembles the Statue of Liberty. It's to the right of that green and white striped tent. This is the Forefathers Monument and at 81 feet tall, it's the tallest solid granite structure in the world. Also on the left-hand side of the boat, but at about 11 o'clock, you'll be able to see a tall smokestack made of red brick. This is Cordage Park, formerly known as Plymouth Cordage Company. It was founded in 1824, and for over 100 years, it was the world's largest supplier of cordage cordage meaning rope. They would import hemp from South America and Russia, basically the marijuana plant, throw away all the bushy parts and keep the long fibrous stems to produce into yes. cordage. These ropes were widely popular with farmers and onboard vessels. They'd be used as mooring lines or anchor lines could be found on whaling ships, ships of the line, and then later on for merchant and naval vessels. So it was of such strategic importance that they were afraid that a German submarine might surface here and launch a sabotage attack. For this reason, they built a watchtower out on the furthest point of land, Gurnet Point, that we'll see in just a moment. 24 hours a day. Plymouth Cordage Company remained the world's largest supplier of cordage up until about World War I. It was at this time that synthetic fibers became available, which were both 
stronger and cheaper to produce. So Plymouth Cordage Company ultimately went out of business. About halfway in between us and Cordage Park, Hello. you'll see that the water is a lot more yellowish in color, and that's because there are very shallow sandbars out there. And these these sandbars are the site of one of the worst shipwrecks on our North American coastline. It occurred in 1778. A vessel named the General Arnold, a square sail brigantine privateer on its way from Boston down Cape Cod Bay headed for the West Indies. With no weather channel back in 1778, they ran into one of our northeast storms. On Christmas Eve, they dropped anchor out at the furthest point of land, Garnet Point, attempting to seek shelter. We don't know exactly what the storm conditions were, but it's pretty safe to assume that they were experiencing those 100 mile per hour winds and 30 foot seas because they dragged their anchor all the way into Plymouth Harbor. By Christmas day, they had ran aground on those shallow sandbars and the ship began to break into pieces. The 105 crew members were forced up onto the top deck, exposed to those high winds and sub-zero temperatures. They used axes to break down the mast, try and lighten the ship and get her afloat. They also tried to make shelter with the sails, but were unsuccessful. The townspeople tried to effect a rescue, but they couldn't get out there. All they had were small boats, which were no match for the storm conditions. So it was three days before they were able to get out there. After three days, the whole harbor had frozen over and they were able to walk out with sleds to take off the few survivors. At the height of the storm, Captain McGee of the vessel gave each man a bottle of whiskey. He ordered them to pour it into their boots and said the alcohol would keep their feet from freezing, maybe give them the chance to survive. But well, only about 20 of the men actually followed the orders and that's the 20 that survived. The other 80 or so thought with it being so cold and they being sailors that there was a better use for the whiskey. Well, as we clear the end of the dunes over on the right, you're going to be able to see three points of land. The furthest point of land you see out there, which I've mentioned a couple times now, is Gurnet Point. It's connected to the mainland and it's part of Plymouth. And if you look closely, you may be able to see a small white structure with a black top. This is a lighthouse known as Plymouth Light, or some people call it Gurnet Point Light. The original lighthouse was built in 1776 and was only the sixth lighthouse to be built on 